I welcome all of our panelists and all of our audience uh, to the Women in Aviation panel. Um, before we start out, I'm just going to highlight certain uh, facts and certain figures and after that I hope all of our conversation will be more experiential in nature. Uh, where we will share challenges and opportunities that each of you have faced. Now, India actually uh, is at the forefront of uh, women in aviation. If we look at uh, just commercial aviation, uh, India is uh, a leader in that. It has the highest number of uh, women pilots uh, compared to any other part of the world. And this number has been doubling. So in 2014, we had about 586 pilots out of the 5,000 so uh, in the country. And today that number is close to 1,000, almost 1,100 out of you know, the 8,900 pilots. So that's an area where uh, women are in the lead. As far as uh, the defense sector is going, I think in the last couple of years, we've seen some important policy changes that have taken place there. As far as the DRDO and the ISRO is concerned, I think we are at a phase where there are more women leaders in each of these uh, research and technical organizations than there have ever been in the past. And with that brief note of introduction, uh, the other point that we will also highlight that uh, while these are commendable, as far as STEM education in our country is concerned, while we do have a parity as far as women getting into uh, the education technical research fields are concerned at almost 50-50, we do see a dropout. So by the time uh, you know, women reach a later stage, not compare, you know, when you look at uh, the technical positions that they hold, there's a drop-off. So out of you know, the 2.8 lakh engineers and scientists employed in research and engineering at our most prominent institutions, only about 14% of those are women. So out of 2.8 lakh uh, engineers and scientists, only 39,000 of those are women. So these are areas that we will bring up in our conversation today and try and understand why there is that drop off. So on that note, I'm going to request uh, Captain Halpreet to start off and I'm going to place a common question to all of our panelists. Perhaps each of them can take a minute or two to highlight to their mind, in their careers, what has been the one biggest challenge that you've had to overcome uh, to get to where you are? It can be personal, it can be professional, it can be something that's close to your heart. Maybe not something that didn't even happen to you, but you observed as a systemic issue happening to women around you. What is that one thing uh, that you've seen as a challenge and managed to overcome? Good evening, everyone, and uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. And to come to your question, first thing is that when you walk into any area of your work, you have to stop thinking you're a woman. You have chosen that job function, and you have to meet that job requirement. And there can be no second thoughts in your mind that because I'm a woman, I cannot do this and I cannot do that. Because you can. Any, it's all in the head. If you, if you just decided that you can do it, you will do it. It's as simple as that. Okay. Simply state it, go into your inner strength, look around you, there is nothing that you cannot do. And just a little bit of a personal challenge, I had the fortunate experience, I can say fortunate now, but at that time it was very adverse. I started off as a pilot without any financial uh, backing, taking loans, etc., in, in an era where there were no women pilots became a pilot, and then tragedy, I get medically grounded, and then I just thought, I can sit and cry or I have to find another solution. And I got into training of pilots, I became an instructor, I got into the simulators, grew in the airline into different areas. Everywhere that I went, I was breaking another glass ceiling. And I said, maybe this is what God wants me to do. They want me to break each and every door there where there was never a woman before. And I think... <laughs> When I look back and I look at my journey as the first woman pilot at that point of time in the international carrier, then as the first lady instructor and the many firsts that followed, it's not the first that's important. It's the fact that you did not give up. And you knew that whatever the adversity, God gives you trouble only when he knows you can overcome it. And it's all in the head. All Thank you. Let's uh, move on. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Prerna, do you tell your own experience uh, in the Indian Navy? Well, it's an honor to be a part of this prestigious panel. 
and uh, very beautiful faces of the audience. Um, I was the observer for the Tu-142M, the Tupelo of Russian aircraft. Uh, the first, um, I will say woman officer, I will negate that because we are officers, we are no woman officer or male officer, that's the first thing. The officer, first officer to be a part of the longest maritime rate reconnaissance aircraft, uh, flying for nine and a half hours at a stretch with uh, no facilities, only you and the radar and all other uh, sensors available to you. The toughest challenge was to prove that you are an asset and not a liability to your own organization. And I think my organization, the Indian Navy, and I would say even the other armed forces have helped not to, um, to prove us and so that we are good at it and not to consider or give us sympathy. sympathy. Mm. Um, my challenge was um, to be the best in my unit and be an asset so that whichever mission my aircraft goes, I am the crew for it. And believe you me, my unit has supported me a lot and I have been at all level exercises, let it be theater level, TROPEX, the DGX, the um, search and shadow missions, name it anything and my crew, I am the important crew and that's thank you so much for my organization that they, um, I would say, believed in me. Right. As far as training is concerned, especially uh, for that uh, first uh, reconnaissance mission that you were telling us about, was there certain specialized training that you had to go through uh, with respect to your gender or does that happen? And there's nothing wrong in admitting it that we are, perhaps women need a uh, certain different kind of uh, training and so on and so forth that, you know, our armed forces need to start taking cognizance of. Um, I'll tell you one thing about the TUs. Um, we do not have, um, I will say, a washroom for us. Mm. Okay? Uh, the aircraft is huge. It's more um, machine friendly rather than um, human being human friendly. friendly. Um, so that was a tough challenge for us. So we were trained right from the beginning how to um, plan your sortie, how to go about it. And uh, believe you me, it's an amazing experience to uh, task yourself to take your uh, body as well as your mind to the limit and uh, prove that yes, you can achieve a mission which is there. Yes. Captain Aprajita, tell us your own experience. I'm uh, officially a paratrooper and uh, being part of the Maroon fraternity, trust me, it's a matter of great pride for me. Firstly, I would say that, uh, you know, every day I take an additional responsibility of not just justifying this uniform, but also justifying the Maroon Beret. And if you talk about the challenges, ma, I would take, you know, rather than calling them challenges, I would say that these are the additional responsibilities or the opportunities. And I would say that these challenges are the driving forces or the striving forces which are making me to do work. I would just share an experience with you. I was uh, doing my para-basic course. So there were two guys who have been doing that course continuously, say good about two, three times in a row. The only reason being that they were doing the ground training, but they were so scared to jump from the aircraft. So they were denying, and that is how they continued doing it. In my, during my course, they were my course mates only. So in my course, for the first sortie, for the first aircraft, I was the first jumper to jump from the aircraft. So seeing me, you know, the boys got motivated. If ma'am can jump, we can very well jump. If a girl can jump. Exactly. If a lady can jump. Exactly. Without their ego, perhaps. So, I would say that that is a, an opportunity for me to lead by that example. And, you know, these avenues are opening up for us, so I'm pretty sure, you know, those, the better future is there. Okay. And again, uh, if I add on to that, I'm, I belong to the para brigade. So the great, the one great challenge what we have is to maintain the physical standards. So, you know, being in the forces, you have to have that discipline, those physical and mentally strong, and those morally upright nature. So like they say, there is a famous saying in our brigade that you've got to walk straight, you've got to talk straight, and you've got to shoot straight. So I would say that uh, it's, it's a matter of great honor to be in that brigade, and if I can, if I can, you know, uh, if I can just, uh, you know, motivate others to be part of it, right. it would be great. Right. On that note, let's move on to uh, Shija. You studied uh, here in India at IIT Kharagpur, then went on to MIT and now at the NASA. 
tell us what uh, your impressions are in your journey, largely research-based. What would you say are your experiences that you've faced? I, uh, I went to one of the IITs and uh, in my batch we were less than 5% women. Uh, when we graduated from the IITs, uh, MIT was better because the U.S. universities have uh, a very active drive towards affirmative action, so representation of minorities is a big deal there. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, the space uh, industry and the, the space sector in general is, is very underrepresented. We are still just 10% or less when I go to conferences and so on. Uh, so being severely outnumbered by men is, uh, has, uh, has effects on, uh, on my mind as more than anything else. So I think the biggest challenges that I've faced have been battling with my own mind. Uh, so there's a lot of stereotypes in being in a place that is male dominated uh, and there's a lot of pressure of performance and it, it's very common not just with me uh, or with other, it's common with other women also to face something called the imposter syndrome where uh, very often you're, you're asking yourself, uh, do I deserve to be here? Correct. So at that point, I ask myself, what can I do that will change my circumstances to change the way I'm thinking? And then I actually work towards changing the circumstances, like reaching out to mentors who are women or people who are uh, known to be great mentors to women or uh, setting goals and milestones and deliverables for myself which are objective to show that uh, I've met them irrespective of the figment of someone else's judgment. So things like that, there's a lot of ways to navigate the space um, and eventually I think it's all in the mind, at least in, in, uh, in research and development and things that we're pushing boundaries towards. All right, and is the issue of uh, pay gap uh, a problem? Do you face that? Uh, do you see that around you? And what kind of challenges does that throw your way? So uh, in the U.S., I can't speak for India, but in the U.S., it's a very common metric to say that an, on an average, a woman is paid 77 cents per dollar that a male is paid. Uh, so factually, it's an issue. That, that is not in my head. So, <laughs> so, and does being underpaid lead to women sometimes dropping out of uh, the area that they are working in? Uh, feel that you know they're not doing as well, can't justify the costs of them working vis-a-vis uh, -vis their male partners, especially in technical research areas? That is definitely something, uh, a, a big concern. Uh, and you can see that in numbers. Again, going back to facts, uh, women in, in universities are almost 40-60 or 50-50, but as you go up the research ladder going to PhDs or then postdocs and then professors, they somehow become from 50% to 5%. And we lose a whole chunk of the workforce along the way. You look at uh, colleagues around you, uh, both women and men, in terms of organization structures, what they can do to uh, create easier work environment, for, especially for women, but also for the men, in terms of you know, whether it is uh, leave, or whether it is certain maternity benefits, or whether it is on uh, facility, crash services and so on and so forth. Uh, it is uh, of course that supportive family was one uh, part. I remember when my son was one year old, I had to carry him in a kangaroo bag. What we put, then ride the kinetic Honda, go and drop him in one of uh, scientists house where the scientist wife was looking after. So that there wasn't a, a government initiated crash or the uh, type of facilities within the organization. Today it's not the same. We have facilities for women employees to take care of children within the office premises. And uh, uh, I've seen when our, our time, they had to bring their child, uh, says, make them sit along with the security guard in their separate room, and then the women were coming inside for work. So that type of sacrifice, but they took care, and those children are all, um, I've seen all of them are engineers, uh, boys and girls who were read. Th that is a type of dedication. <laughs>